So as you probably gathered from both Cooley's theory of the looking glass self and Mead's theory of taking the role of the other, um, during interactions, we really never know what other people are thinking about us, right? But it still has a really significant impact on how we come to view and understand ourself. All we can observe is a person's role performance, which is essentially how they're behaving and expressing in any given role that they're occupying, right? So uh, one other theorist that we'll throw into the mix here is Irving Goffman, and he developed a really interesting theory about how we as humans strive to present ourselves in any given interaction. And he compared social interactions that we have as human beings to actors on a stage. And this is a theory that he called dramaturgy. So according to Goffman, we use this tactic called impression management, which is a conscious or subconscious process in which we attempt to present ourselves to others as we hope to be perceived, right? So thinking back to the looking glass self and that idea of the reflection you might see when you look in a mirror from four different people's perspectives, right? Uh, we attempt to present ourselves to other people in certain contexts based off of how we want them to perceive us. So we're trying to control their impressions of us. We're trying to control how other people perceive us every time we interact with someone. And sometimes this is very conscious, right? Like for example, if you go to a job interview, you are probably going to wear your best dress. You're going to act very professional. When you're in that interview, you're going to sit up straight and speak very proper because you are really trying to control how that potential employer views you. You want them to look at you in a favorable light. Right? On the flip side of that, you might not always care so much about how you're presenting to others, or at least you might be more subconscious about it. So when you're hanging out with friends after the job interview, you know, you might loosen up that tie or kick off those high heels and you might start swearing when you're talking with your friends and being a lot more casual and slouching because you're not so concerned about how those other people are perceiving you. Or perhaps you still are concerned about how those other people are perceiving you, but you want your friends to view you as being easygoing rather than uptight, right? So each social interaction, according to Goffman, is like a new scene in a play, right? And individuals perform different roles depending on whoever is present. So similar to being in a play, the setting of our interaction and the props that we use in that interaction matter a lot too. We have been socialized to understand the expected roles people will hold in certain spaces. Another good example is if you ever have to go to court, right? You will likely present yourself very differently in the courtroom, which Gotham referred to as front stage, right? When you're actually out and acting in front of an audience than you would in the parking lot, which would be considered backstage in this particular example, right? When you're in the parking lot, you don't think people are viewing you. You don't think people are watching you. So in the courtroom, you'll probably dress very professionally, you'll be quiet, you'll only speak when you're spoken to, you'll stand up when the judge enters, you'll refer to the judge as your honor, etc. We know that if the judge uses his gavel, a prop in this particular interaction and pounds it on his desk, it means that we all need to shut up and be quiet, right? So all of these props, these people, these actors in this interaction affect how we choose to present ourselves, depending on what our goal is or what our end game is, right? Obviously, if we're going to court, you know, maybe you got a ticket, a traffic violation, and you're going to court to try and defend it so you can get out of it. You want, your objective is to present yourself as respectable as possible, to create a positive impression management with this individual, in this case, the judge in the court scene, to try and get that ticket expunged so you don't need to pay the fine or do community service or whatever your punishment was for breaking that law, right? So the judge will maintain order with these props, like the gavel and a robe, to symbolize their authority in that setting. Um, but then, say for example, you're front stage in the courtroom trying to present yourself very well, engage in positive impression management, but the judge decides that he's not convinced and they want you to pay the fine anyway. And you get out in the parking lot and you loosen up your necktie. You call your friend on the phone and start cussing this judge up and down and say, this judge was such a prick, you know. I went in there, I pled my case, and he still didn't, uh, he still is making me pay this ticket and blah, 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 blah. Right? So you're backstage. You don't think the people that you're trying to impress a certain opinion upon are no longer watching you. So you engage in very different behavior in that context, right? Again, think of 
every social interaction you have, right? When you come into a classroom, for example, you're very respectful, right? You're probably quiet. You sit back and only speak when the professor of the class asks you question or seeks your input, right? Uh, when you go and visit your parents, you know, you're probably not telling them that you were out until 3 a.m. the night before at a kegger at your friend's place, right? You're trying to present yourself in a positive light there versus if you play sports, you know, and you're in the locker room and you have locker room talk with your teammates where you're kind of vulgar and talk about anything goes, right? So you try and engage in different levels of impression management, try and present yourself to others very, very differently in every social interaction we have. Now, sometimes the way we try to present ourselves is very conscious behavior on our part. We put a lot of thought and effort into it. Other times it's more subconscious and we're more relaxed with how we engage with others. This really just depends on the individual and the social environment that they're engaging with others in. So let's change gears a little bit here and talk more specifically about this process of socialization. So I'd like you all to think for a minute about your favorite toys from childhood, okay? Think about your favorite toys from your childhood. If you think of your childhood and the number one toy that you played with all the time, what values, attitudes, or behaviors did you learn from playing with that particular toy? So if you'd like, you can pause the video for a minute or two here. Think about your ch favorite childhood toy, and then think about any behaviors, attitudes, or values that you learned, that you internalized from playing with that particular toy. So some further questions to reflect upon. How do playing with certain toys growing up teach you about expectations to things like your gender, your family life, or even the workforce? So here's two examples of toys that are pretty common amongst kids. On the left side, we have a tool set, and on the right side, we have a kitchen set, right? Now, depending on uh, certain factors such as socioeconomic status, gender, etc., you may have had access to either or neither or both of these toys as a child, right? But as you can see in this example, this is kind of a stereotypical example about how we start to learn or be socialized into gender appropriate behavior based on this binary understanding of certain toys are for boys and certain toys are for girls. Now in a few weeks when we talk about gender, we're going to complicate this idea that gender is this really rigid binary that only exists with two distinct categories. But for now, we'll work with this as a model, right? So on the left side, we see um, uh, what appears to be a young boy playing with this tool set, right? He has a hammer in there, a screwdriver, a saw, it looks like there's even a shop vac attached in there, uh, wood pieces so he can assemble a birdhouse it looks like or build different forms of construction. So this particular toy is socializing or teaching this young boy skills that he may or would be anticipated to need in for, uh, later on in his life, right? Becoming a carpenter, you know, becoming a construction worker, doing something with his hands, perhaps engineering or architecture, right? Now, on the flip side, we have this kitchen set, and we see what appears to be a young girl playing with this kitchen set. Now, what do you notice about this particular toy, this kitchen set on the right side of the screen here? You know, something interesting, it's not just a toy that seems to be teaching this young girl that she should probably learn how to cook. But actually, it's a toy that teaches her that she probably needs to multitask and learn several other roles in her position as a woman in society. Most notably, we see that this kitchen set includes a baby and a high chair attachment on the side of the counter, right? Socializing or teaching this young girl that in addition to learning how to cook, she should also learn how to take care of young children. There's also a phone in the kitchen, perhaps indicating that the woman should become familiar with the role of being a secretary, being able to answer phones while cooking and taking care of children, and, uh, simulating this need for women to be able to multitask, particularly when taking care of the home. Right. So these toys from a very young age that we've been playing with, oftentimes playing with subconsciously, not even obviously recognizing why we have these toys in the first place, as they're often gifted to us from parents or aunts, uncles, etc. These toys teach us certain values and behaviors that are expected of us in this context based off of our gender. And these toys playing with and interacting with these toys has a meaningful effect 
on the sense of self we come to identify as. In this context, it has a meaningful effect on our sense of gendered identity or gendered self. So this all is referring to a process in sociology that we refer to as socialization, which is the process in which people learn the appropriate ways, values, norms, beliefs, behaviors, etc. of a certain group or a certain society. And the way we go about learning the appropriate ways or experiencing the socialization is through what we call agents of socialization. So agents of socialization are the groups such as family, peers, friends, teachers, etc., or institutions, things like school, religion, government, workplace, and the media, that teach us the expected values, norms, and actions of a certain group. So if you are a little girl, you are not just born knowing that you should learn how to cook or to learn that you should be expected to be able to be a caregiver and nurturer for children. You learn that through this agent of socialization. In this instance, toys are an agent of socialization, right? Or advertisements for toys that we see in the media are agents of socialization. Perhaps you grew up in a household where your mother was a stay-at-home mom and she was expected to do all the cooking and cleaning in the house. So in that context, your mother would be an agent of socialization, teaching you the norms of the expectations for a certain group within any given society. So socialization is a lifelong process, which means we are constantly being socialized. So this starts at a very young age. We begin to internalize the values and beliefs of our society at a very young age. But these values may shift over time as we're exposed to and grapple with different agents of socialization. Uh, so let's go ahead and watch this video here to show us just how early on we start to learn and internalize aspects of socialization. Children have a strong sense of gender identity and gender role expectations. Most two-year-olds know with certainty whether they are male or female, and by the age of four or five begin not only to develop gender constancy, but often show rigid standards for what they believe is appropriate male and female dress and behavior. Can boys put on dresses? Do girls have short hair or long hair? Hi. Are you a boy or a girl? A boy. <laughs> are you ever going to be a girl? No. What are boys like? Oh, um, I don't know. Are they different than girls? How are they different than girls? Because they don't put stuff like girls on. Boys don't put on girls' clothes? No. Can girls put on boys' clothes? No. Alexis, are you a boy or a girl? A girl. Are you ever going to be a boy? Mm -mm. Are you a boy or a girl? Boy. Are you ever going to be a girl? No. Boys are better than girls. Why? Because boys are stronger than the girls sometimes. What would happen if you put on a dress? All the girls and all the boys would laugh at me. I would look like a boy that would look like a girl. Would it be okay? No way. Young children appear to begin to acquire gender role stereotypes at about the same time that they develop gender identity. And by the age of three or four, most children, when asked questions about the activities appropriate for a male doll and a female doll, readily give stereotypic responses. Which doll likes to clean the house? This one. Who takes care of the babies? <laughs> this one. Who goes to work? <laughs> this one. <laughs> So take it a minute or two and reflect on what you saw in that video. If you'd like, you can rewind this particular video lecture and rewatch it. Otherwise, there is a link included in the slides this week so you can access that and rewatch that video if you'd like. And think about uh, what you observed in this video. Take some notes about things that surprised you or stood out to you. And we'll pick up with this in the next video lecture.